mega classes will be uh, devoted to your presentations. Okay. So when they will be, uh, we'll talk about that later. And for the uh, group topics, I still don't have uh, group topics from groups four, five, seven. industrializing, a uh, lot of, you know, young adults, meaning like teenagers, okay, uh, who migrated in search of jobs, okay? Anyway, the highest rate of migration was between the ages of 15 and 19. Next high, highest was between 10 and 14. It's amazing, eh? So the largest proportion 
uh, or when it comes to age uh, of migrants, the highest proportion was between the ages of 15 and 19, uh, because they are the the most sort of agile. They are the most uh, like easily trainable workers, right? Or could be workers if they were to uh, migrate to find a job. The next highest was between 10 and 14. Now we'll try to understand why these people or the people in, in these age groups migrated. Second thing we can look at is what are the reasons for migration for these age groups? We have two top age groups who migrated, 15 to 19 and 10 and 14. Why did they migrate? I already said it in passing. Yes, job opportunities. And that's for the those in the age bracket of 15 to 19. What about those in, uh, in the ages of 10 to 14? Why do they migrate? Education. Education, very good. Two reasons for the highest migration rate found for 15 uh, to 19 age group. Economic pressure to find jobs, okay? And do you think these uh, people who migrated are from wealthy land land owning families or the, the sort of poor families? Chances are yes, poor. Uh, for the uh, the age group uh, of uh, ten to fourteen, for better education. Okay. Sex competition. Uh, when it comes to urbanization, and I think although the, the findings here are focused on Korea, I think you could uh, make generalizations. Okay? Uh, so let's say in any given country in the world, there is this rapid urbanization. Which sex or which gender is more likely to migrate? Male or female? Male. Very good. So, same thing happened in India. Uh, and uh, just to talk a little bit uh, more specifically, uh, for the children aged 5 to 9, which gender, if I'm getting mixed up here, should I say which sex or which gender? Which sex uh, was, do you think, more likely to migrate in the 1960s and 70s? and even 1980s. Hmm? It is consistent with the general trend, which is to say, born males uh, migrated. Why? Especially in the Korean context. Yeah. Mm. You see, back uh, in the 1960s and 70s, when many families had to make a choice of sending only one or two children to urban centers to get better education. It's not like today where, you know, boys and girls have the same chance in the family, right? But back in the 1960s and 70s, Many families were poor. More families than now were poor, and they could only support uh, education or provide education for only uh, uh, like uh, one or two, or maybe <coughs> half of the, civil, uh, the the children, right? And when that choice had when that choice had to be made, they typically chose males. Okay, and uh, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but in Korea, education is free up to where? Which which grade? I think it's junior high school. No, junior yeah. high. So education is provided for free up to grade nine only. But back in the 1960s and 70s, and even up to the 80s, education was provided for free only up to elementary education. Okay. So, 
to send children to junior high even, it costed money. And, and, and families which do not have the means, uh, just, you know, uh, had money to send like sons to uh, uh, like junior high and high school and, and so on. Uh, and economic status and reason for migration. Children and teenagers from wealth families migrated for their education, while children and teenagers from poor families migrated in search of work to help support their family in rural areas. So, uh, again, we started off with uh, the stages of migration, and this, the last uh, few slides, we looked at, you know, the sex composition, the reasons for migration, okay? So, and I think uh, um, the part on education is, is, I think, particularly sort of uh, limited to the Korean context. But as far as the sex composition and age are concerned, I think they are applicable to many other contexts or in many other national contexts which experience rapid urbanization. Okay, the, now I turn to like, the last part uh, on this uh, urbanization and it's about you know problems associated with rapid urbanization in Korea and also maybe uh, characteristics. Actually this is not the last part, it's the second last part. It's the last part I compare urbanization in Korea versus urbanization in the West. Because there are many interesting <coughs> qualitative differences. Okay? First, um, number of cities with more than 50,000 residents is 72. I don't know, that, may, that number may have increased uh, by a few, uh, uh, but let's just say, it's just, I mean, it's not really that important uh, anyway. Uh, 90, uh, more than 90 percent of the total population live in cities with more than 20,000 residents. Only Seoul and six other major cities, along with Gyeonggi Province, saw noticeable population increase since the 1950s. And can you name the largest cities in Korea, just for fun? Seoul is number one. Number two, Busan. Number three. Okay. Number four. No? They, I think. Number five. Anyway, here's the list. Uh, this is based on the 2010 uh, national census. <coughs> Seoul is number one. Busan, Incheon, Daegu, Daejeon. Okay, Gwangju, Ulsan, Suwon. Right? So, uh, Surrounding Seoul, you already have Bucheon, Yongin, Goyang, Songnam, and you could sort of also say Suwon, right? And Incheon. So you have about six uh, top cities in Korea near the vicinity of Seoul, right? Uh, so the megalopolis that we talked about could be applied to the, the capital region. Uh, third, all between 1975 and 1997, urban land prices increased about 18 times, and we're going to come back to that a little bit later when we talk about solar. Okay, uh, environmental degradation due to unplanned and sporadic land use, low priority on environment, and, and high priority on expanding. Quantitative urban facilities, uh, more apartments than houses. Do you sense that? Like I'm, I, I want to ask uh, foreign students, when you see Korea, you see all these high rises and they're typically apartments, okay? Only the ones that you see in downtown area or in Gangnam along the Tehran uh, road you see, most of the high-rises you see are apartments, okay? 
an increase in one. So if I'm really skipping fast, that's because it's not really that important. Now, but this is important, uh, not for the exam, but just for your knowledge. Uh, excessive concentration of population and economic <coughs> activities in the capital region. And look at this. The capital region comprises only about 12% of the total land in South Korea, but more than 46% of the population live in the region. And how do we know that it is really, too, really, really concentrated? Compare Korea's sort of a 46% with Japan and France. Both countries also su suffer from population concentration in the capital region. The concentration rate is 32% in, in Tokyo, uh, or Japan, uh, it's 80% in France. So it's really uh, not a good uh, sort of a situation because everything is concentrated here, meaning if you sort of, sort of we still have Koreans from the countryside. If there are any young people who are, who are still available, who are still uh, in the countryside who want to migrate to urban centers uh, and people from uh, even uh, small cities, uh, they still migrate to Seoul. And, um, and look at this, 70 to 90 percent of government offices, now that is changing. Uh, since I think um, it was during the No uh, administration that wanted to disperse uh, government headquarters throughout the country. Okay? It came a bit late, but it's, it's, it's sort of a change in the right direction. Okay? Again, before now, uh, many government uh, agencies are moving, uh, relocating to places all over South Korea, okay? To Jeju, Busan, Daegu, Gwangju, Mokpo, right? Uh, finally, because uh, I think, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, most, if not all, economic advanced nations do have these government agencies sort of uh, spread out throughout the, the, the country. But in Korea, for a very long time, everything was in Seoul, okay? Uh, yeah? Yes, so, but not all sort of the government agencies are relocated to Sejong. It's just part of, I mean, the, 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 the major big ones are relocating to Sejong, but sort of uh, other ones are also relocating to uh, other uh, cities. Okay? But when it comes to corporate headquarters, foreign companies, research institutes, they're concentrated in the capital region. Uh, and, um, and look at this, 96% of the headquarters of large conglomerates are based in the capital region. Now let's just compare with, let's say, the United States. Some of the like the best known sort of brands, their headquarters are definitely not in Washington. Their headquarters are definitely not in New York. And I could just name a few: Starbucks. Where do you think its headquarters is based in? Seattle. What about Lockheed's or the Boeing? I think it's Colorado, Denver, Denver, uh, Denver, Denver. <laughs> Denver, uh, Colorado. Uh, can you name some other uh, headquarters or brands? <coughs> Microsoft, where is that at? Or in? Washington State. But if you're to name anything in Korea, Samsung, where do you think it's located? Seoul, Hyundai, SK, LG, and you can name any other brand that you were familiar with, and chances are it'll be in Seoul. Okay? Um, and personally, I also can say this. You know, we have thousands of publishers, and when I have to write a, an article, uh, you know, I, have to, I cite the sources that I use. And for books, you know how you have to uh, identify the place of 
origin or the place where the book was printed. Now, for sources or books written in English, I always have to check the front to see where that book was published because the books are published in so many different places. But for Korea, I don't even check. It's always like Seoul. And then the name of the publisher. Of course, I could be wrong, but that's the extent of how things are uh, concentrated in, 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 in the Seoul uh, region. And all the prestigious universities are found in the capital region. Uh, I don't think you know this, but as far as late as the, let's say, like the late 1990s, some of the universities in the countryside were competitive. They were, I'm, I'm talking about universities like Busan, Jungbuk, uh, just to name uh, two. They would be ranked higher than, let's say, or as high as Gongbu or Dongbu uh, or Jungang. What's the situation now? See, because of this sort of uh, our mindset, so focused on the capital region, anything outside the capital region is sort of looked down upon, I guess. Uh, so we talked about how, I mean, we didn't really talk about this much. We have this urban mindset, but <coughs> our problem in Korea is that we have a soul mindset where everything in Seoul is the best. Okay? Uh, so that people living in the countryside or outside of Seoul, they have this complex, I think. And am I exaggerating this? And you can e easily imagine students studying outside of the capital region to always somehow feel sort of the, them being sort of inadequate. Um, so, um, because everything is about the mind, right? Interpretation. And I think uh, we really have to get, go beyond, go, get past this uh, uh, overly soul concentrated sort of everything, right? Uh, soul center development has limited the economic potential of other regions, so sure, for sure. Uh, regional disparity in economic development and growth, job opportunities, levels of social welfare, quality of life, and chances for personal advancement. The high population density in Seoul, 15,000. Versus the national average of 487. World average is only 44. Which country has the highest population density? Just for fun. See, who said China? No, no, I'm not. You know, China is the fourth largest country in the world. But what's the largest country in the world in terms of the land size? Russia. Russia, number two. Canada, number three. United States, number four, China. And you shouldn't be really too focused on the ranking because two, three, four. Differences are minimal. But somehow, we think of China as being much smaller than the United States, don't we? But it's almost as big as the United States. Okay? Uh, and maybe there is this conspiracy of uh, the world map makers, which tend to make China smaller than it really should be. I'm not kidding. When you look at the world map, you do have this impression of China being smaller than what it really is. Check, check it out. Okay? It's worse. <laughs> Did you ever wonder why we're always east? I want to be west. We should have been west if we had the whole power. <laughs> okay, list of countries with by population density. Number one is Macau, Monaco, Singapore, 
Hong Kong. I mean, of course, you can really not call this a country, right? Same thing with uh, Macau. Bahrain and Malta, South Korea is 21. And where is China? You see? Can you see China here? That's how big the country is. Although, Chinese population, 1.3 billion, doesn't sound like much unless you compare it in like this way. Korea's population, let's say 50 million. Chinese population is thir nearly 30 times that. And yet, population density is only 138 because the land is huge. Again, the reason that you didn't really think of it as being so huge is because your, I, your thoughts are, in many ways, shaped by Western-centric views. And I just want to say this in passing again. How many of you heard of this phrase, China? As a new Now, who came up with that idea? Was it our own Korean thought? No, that's very, very American. Okay? So you always have to question. Ideas you have, where do they come from? It's usually things you read and things you hear. Okay? So nothing you really know is really your own. Okay? And if you know that, it, life is really difficult to live. <laughs> so just get some visual images of how crowded Seoul is. And, and so many apartments. And, you know, I'm a, a very, I have a lot of pride in being a Korean, but I, I'm also a big enough man to accept criticism. The people who criticize about things Korean. Now, one of the better known uh, authors of many books on travel, like, you know, like Lonely Planet type books. I don't remember this guy's name, but he said something like this. The Seoul is one of the ugliest cities in the world. And I have to totally agree. Because if you just drive around or look around, it's really ugly because there's too many apartments everywhere. And even places where I want to see the mountain is blocked by what? Apartments. <laughs> So uh, let's be big enough to accept that, okay? It is a lovely city, but I love it anyway. <laughs> so ugly meaning the physical, okay? Outlay, all right? Yeah? Mm. Yes. We're talking about the overall impression. Because uh, we're so used to these apartments where you know you have this impression of we have a saying in Korean, Songyangka. What is that in mat matchbox? Sort of sort of being set up like a domino. We have many apartment complexes like that. And that's what one of the reasons why the landscape of Seoul uh, could come across as, as being ugly. So that is why the Seoul Metro government has a new law where you need to have a very creative architectural design to get permission to build a, a new apartment. Okay? So that's why new apartments really look nice now. Okay? This is an outdated picture. So these, these are the typical apartments uh, that were built, let's say, 19, in the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, this is my problem. <laughs> you know, the population density is 15,000 in Seoul. Reflected in a place like this, I think. This is a young one. Subway. Has anybody ever ridden a subway like at 8:30 in the morning? 
and you know what this is like, right? Uh, just very recently, yes, I was on one of those uh, trains. Oh my God, move in, and you're stuck, and you can't even move, right? Can't even stretch your arms, right? Um, All right, population concentration in Seoul has brought about many problems. Real estate, price hikes. You know, I, I, I have it here, but I still cannot believe this. Okay? And now, Canada is about 40 times, 46 times larger than the Korean Peninsula, and 101 times larger than South Korea. Now, Canada can be bought six times with the value of the, uh, the asset, like the land, the real estate value, and France, four times. You see, so much money has been invested in the land. Okay? And you know why the economy in Korea sucks? Too much money is, 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 in the, is, is sort of stuck. It's, it's not liquid, right? It's not a, uh, because what makes the economy go around is when people spend. People <coughs> use money to buy things. But when you invest in things like apartments, land, does land move? That is why Koreans love the land. It's killing our economy. Okay? Because all these rich people are buying land instead of <coughs> opening up, you know, shops, restaurants, not me, okay, we have too many of those. Like starting ventures, right? Starting like new, sort of brilliant new sort of business ideas, you know, you invest money into that. But they're not doing that, you see. Um, and half of the U.S. real estate can be bought with that money. Uh, cost an average of uh, 9.3 years salary to buy a house in Seoul. 9.8 years of average salary without a cent being spent. So, unless you have a rich parent, let's say you are a member of a middle class family, okay? You have to spend 10 years and don't spend a single dime to be able to buy a house, okay? And, but the, the average sort of span of time that you have to spend, uh, like, you know, saving up every cent you make, it's about five to six, seven years in the West, okay? So this is how we know that there is definitely a bubble in land prices. Okay? That's the only way we can make comparisons. Because if countries have different living standards. So let's say if you live in Canada and you make an average income, you only need to save up for five to six years to buy an average priced house. But in Korea, it takes like 10 years. Okay? Uh, so and we're talking about an apartment, a, a space in the, in the air. That's what it is, really, right? Um, and philosophically, someone even said this. This earth that we live on. Who first came up with this idea of owning it? Isn't this crazy? One day, can someone say, this air is mine, and you pay me money to breathe? Because if you really think about it, whoever invented this idea of owning a land, because you see in North America, Native Americans, do they have a sense of owning the land? No. And that was beautiful, I think. Okay? And the tribes in Africa, same thing. The sense, this idea of ownership came about from Europe. <laughs> I'm talking about from North America. Okay? Uh, of course, in Korea too, from some time, I don't know when, some crazy guy said, this is my land. Uh, and 
that's why we're because if you didn't have to worry about this housing, you could have so much fun with life, right? Because look at your parents. They spend all their life paying off their debts, mortgage. Okay? And you you're in, in the same fate. Yes or no? Housing, place you sleep. Right? So, series, shortage of affordable housing, shortage of public facilities. Uh, when it comes to the public facilities, what else can we say? Libraries, pools, anything else? Hmm? Parks, very good. Hmm? Parking lots? Public parking lots. True. Uh, especially the Ita one, right? <laughs> uh, where else? What else? Public facilities. We do have enough playgrounds, although no one, no children play. <laughs> it's used more for daily places. <laughs> no children, no children. <laughs> Any other public facilities we can talk about? Uh, people living in Seoul are said to have one of the highest stress levels in the world due to, among others, the high population density. You know, you sort of don't realize this, but every time you get in the subway during rush hour, your stress hormone goes up, I'm sure, very high. You just don't know it, but it's there. Because by nature, we're supposed to live in a very crowd-free environment. Okay, for millions of years, if you believe in the theory of evolution, you know, did we live in a setting like Seoul today? For millions of years? No. It was like walking around for days without running into any other person. And after a few days, you run into another homo sapien and say, hey. <laughs> and, you know, of course, didn't have speech then, back, back then, right? It would be like, and then even this waving came about maybe 50,000 years ago, so I didn't know how they greeted. They'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> so, like cancer, right? Cancer, we have cancer. Cancer is, is, a, is a relatively recent is a sickness, right? Because of the new environments that we're exposed to and the types of food that we eat that are not, that are not natural to us. Uh, I mentioned this in the globalization class, but uh, if you were to <coughs> dissect or just compare the stomach of herbivore versus with the carnivore, in which uh, animal do you think has a much longer stomach or intestine? Herbivore has much longer. We're talking about, let's say you compare lion's intestine versus cow's intestine. Maybe the, what's, no. Intestines of lions versus what's a grass eating animal that's similar size of uh, lions. Lamb. So well, that's meat. <laughs> the, the animal that produces lamb? Sheep. <laughs> Let's say you compare the intestines of lions with the intestines of sheep. The sheep's intestines are much, much longer because it takes much, that much longer to digest vegetables, okay? Now, you bring in humans. Their intestines are similar to lions or sheep. It's sheep. Okay, so for millions of years, did we eat meat? No, because we didn't have fire. We didn't know how to make fire for such a long time. Okay? Only when we learn how to make fire, 
they may begin to, begin to eat meat. And eating meat is unnatural to us. It's like cows eating themselves. <laughs> or cows all of a sudden, over millions of years of evolution, becoming cow lions or something. <laughs> Start to, you know, pick on other lesser animals. Domesticate uh, pigs. Because, you see, uh, the lion's intestines are short because they have to digest the meat that, is, that easily rots. Okay? That's why the digestion is very fast. Okay? So when we eat meat, very unnatural, what happens to your intestine? It is working over time to digest this monster thing that was, that was eaten, it, which is rotten in your intestine. So what should you do? And I know it's very difficult to do that. So what I always t tell to say to others is to, to, to at, least, at least practice this. Eat as little meat as possible. And if you cannot become a vegetarian, that's the best thing you can do. Okay? And respect the, the lives of all the animals we kill to eat. Just to give an example, what's the lifespan of cows? 30 years. And when do we typically slaughter cows? After 24 months. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but if you know that, it really gives you this creepy thought, you know, just <coughs> slaughtering this, this precious life for your own. 30 years of life to live, and yet, after two years, why, why only after two years? <coughs> they no longer grow. So the best time to kill these cows is when they're too fully grown, best to eat. What about pigs? Their lifespan is about 20 years. You kill them when they are eight months old. Should we eat your samgyeopsal now? As much as you do. <laughs> Did I see a hand back there? Yeah, but, I mean, as a vegetarian, mm. living in Korea, I think it's really difficult for Korean people to be vegetarians because uh, everything is about meat. Um, it's really like, just for example, buying vegetables is so expensive in Korea. Um, whatever you want to eat, fruits and things like this, I have the impression that. Um, quality of the fruits, for example, they are grown with like, uh, maybe it's because of the landscape of the area or maybe it's imported, the quality of the fruits and everything that you can eat, like vegetables, mm. is like not that good, like with a lot of pesticides and things like this sometimes, so it's still not huge to I have to agree, although I'm not a vegetarian, but, <laughs> but um, this, the, the cost of vegetables is, I think, Expensive. The quality may not be as high as uh, those you find uh, in the West. Um, okay, anyone else? Uh, you know, I think for visitor vegetarians, you have a wonderful dish called bibimbap. Make sure you tell them not to put beef, right? Uh, or egg, fried egg, if you don't like. Right. Um, also, we have a severe traffic congestion that everyone knows about. Average vehicle speed in Seoul, 13 kilometers per hour. Um, that is so true. And in Gangnam, it's down to 5 kilo kilometers per hour. Uh, this is... Showing you the the worst <laughs> possible uh, scenarios, right? Okay, 
Uh, now the last section, and that has to do with <coughs> comparison of urbanization in the West and Korea. And this will be on the final exam, yes or no? Yes. Yes, yes it will be on the final exam. I gave it away. All right. Um, what, in what ways urbanization in the West and Korea have been different? So I'd like to ask you first and then tell you what, what I have. So if you were to guess what, uh, how urbanization in the West has been or have been and, and how they are different from the, the urbanization experiences of Korea. Anybody? More rapid. Very good. So in the the West took how long do you think to urbanize? Very good. West took about two hundred years to urbanize. And Korea? I mean, we don't really say Korea continued to industrialize in the 2000s. So we're talking about 30, 40 years of urbanization. And, and then, I was going to say the rapid industrialization. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? If I had more time, I'll just wait it until somebody said it. But let me hear just one more student say something about my question. And I'll just wait until somebody says something. <coughs> if you have nothing to say, say something about human intestine or something. <laughs> Meat. I think that's a good point, although it may not be on the, on the list. I think urbanization in the West has been more, like, better planned. I'll give you an example. If you go to Paris, one thing you'll notice is that the center of Paris is the same as what it, what it was like 50 years ago. It, is, it has carefully preserved the, sort of, the look of tradition. So if you want to find like high-rise apartments, you have to go out and maybe drive half an hour outside. That's, that's true, right? But if you look at Seoul, you know, only now we try to preserve things of the past, but too much uh, have been destroyed, okay? And for a long time, we took pride in making Korea look modern, okay? So it was rather than trying to preserve you know, like old buildings, we always wanted to build new ones, okay? And so the, the planning was definitely not there. Anyway, uh, here's what, what I have. The West. Industrial cities began to take shape since the 1770s, so urbanization has been in progress for the last 23 years. So, uh, so let's say it's, you know, it took about 200 years. And this is another key point. Industrialization and urbanization went hand in hand. Let me ask you this. In Korea, did industrialization and urbanization go hand in hand? Yes or no? industrialization 
not really connected um, because when Japan was colonizing them, they weren't industrializing Korea, but they were pulling everybody to the mm. cities. So let's say industrialization in Korea began in the 1960s. Now, did that was that did that coincide with urbanization? I don't think so because a lot of people weren't moving specifically for job opportunities, but also education. Mm. Although you know the three stages that we talked about, according to that, I think we could almost say that. It, went hand in hand, but uh, let's say in developing countries, you think this is true or not? In developing countries. It's def definitely not true because in developing countries, urbanization always precedes industrialization. Okay? Always. So Korea, not quite the Western style of like industrialization and urbanization going hand in hand, because strictly speaking, urbanization preceded urban, uh, industrialization, but only by maybe a, a generation. Okay, but in, if you look at uh, developing countries in other parts of Asia uh, and in Africa, you see. Vast urbanization. We're talking about 40 to 50 percent. Remember the charts I showed you? 40 to 50 percent of people living in urban centers, but there's no sign of industrialization yet. Right? So, uh, in uh, developing countries, urbanization always precedes industrialization. Okay? Urbanization took place along with economic, technological, political, and social changes. Is that true for Korea? Yes or no? Yeah, to a certain extent. Okay. Um, and the way of thinking had changed as well? Is that true in Korea or not? Definitely no. Uh, I was exaggerating, but you know how Korea is... I mean, if you look at Korea, their thought patterns are still <coughs> stuck in tradition. So they have a one foot in tradition and the other foot in sort of new global sort of style thinking maybe. Urbanization is an even process for many urban centers, including small to mid-sized cities, yes or no, in Korea? Not really, right? Because Korean urbanization has been very Seoul-centered and Seoul and few other cities, okay? Uh, and yes, there is this better urban planning, okay? And this is the reason. You know, in Korea, it's only in Gangnam, not even Gang, okay, to a certain extent, Gangnam, and definitely in Bundang. If you go there, the the road. <coughs> How do you know uh, there? You know, a city has uh, had a good urban planning. One good physical evidence is to look at how the roads are sort of sort of built. So you have a, if you have roads that look like this, right? Like straight lines, then it is better planned. But if you look at Seoul, what's the roads like? Crooked all over the place, okay? So there was never really a good urban planning to begin with, okay? Uh, lack of government involvement in determining which cities were developed and in the West, suburbanization. But in Korea, we don't really have a suburbanization, right? Because if you just look at Seoul, surrounding Seoul is not suburbs. Surrounding Seoul is other cities, right? Okay, now let's look at Korea. It took just 40 years to urbanize. Urbanization took place prior to industrialization. So I, I want to make a qualitative difference. Uh, urbanization to a certain extent, okay, at that point, to a certain extent. 
Uh, rapid urbanization led to regional disparity. So some cities became too big, and every other city and region lost its population to these big cities. Greater government intervention in determining which cities got developed. administrative systems are relatively modern, but people's psyche and thoughts are still steeped in tradition, leading to conflict between modernity and tradition. Urbanization is uneven. Um, and a noteworthy fact about urbanization in developing economies is that in comparison to its overall level of industrialization, they are over-urbanized. As some people live in the cities, as more people live in the cities than can reasonably be supported by the infrastructures. So, uh, again, this is not, I don't know if you would agree that this is, is this applicable to Korea, yes or no? Yes? So, we have a situation where the infrastructures cannot properly serve the number of people living, let's say, in Seoul or Busan. Question mark. Okay. All right. So I have for you, and it's already ten o'clock. So uh, have your group meeting. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Again, I'll see you in two weeks. Right.